Gus, you were the second professional economist to hold the Cabinet Secretary's job after Andrew Turnbull. Do you think that's an advantage in today's world, to be numerous and economically literate? Uh, I do, and I, my background was an academic economist, and economics is so important to the success of governments, you know, jobs, to people, really. And so understanding the way economies works, not that our understanding is anything like as good as it should be, uh, I think is crucial. And to be honest, it shows as well the way the civil service has changed. Because if you remember, there's that lovely Yes Minister episode where there's a specialist in the room and he's, he's, he, he confides to the minister that he's not going to get very far. And he says, why not? He says, well, I'm an economist. And in those days, I think you were held back. Uh, nowadays, I think we love having people with professional skills in the civil service and be they economics, history, whatever. It must be quite tough if the Prime Minister you work for isn't particularly numerate or economically literate. How do you manage that? Um, <sighs> Tell me yeah, stories, yeah, um, slides. Uh, we, the, the system works. I mean, with chancellors and prime ministers who've uh, got varying degrees of economics, you know, some very expert, some not. The correlation between the degree of their expertise and the success of the economy and the government is quite low, unfortunately. You're an economic historian as well, of course, don't you, by background? Well, I think... You, you absolutely need to look at history and you absolutely need to uh, look back and say, so, so what should we learn from this episode? Not that history, to my mind, ever repeats itself in quite the same way, but the one thing I've learned from history is being prepared for every eventuality that actually our predictive powers are quite low and so it makes sense to do lots and lots of preparation for all sorts of different scenarios. So you're keen on your successor, Jeremy Hayward's uh, new initiative on... Horizon scanning, giving a boost across departmental horizon scanning. Absolutely. I think one of the things, if you look at back, for example, at the uh, financial crisis, you know, and you, and you look at where was that on our risk register, uh, actually it wasn't there because we were concentrating on non-economic issues, actually, within the Cabinet Office. Uh, I think it's really important that we, we do these sorts of things where someone thinks that the unthinkable and says, well, what if? Mm. And we've got a contingency plan because I've... I've known occasions where something's arisen where actually you're struggling around and in the first couple of hours of a crisis, uh, you really need to have some expertise there. A classic example would be the foot and mouth crisis where the second time round was a lot better handled than the first time. Uh, and that was because we, we'd learned a lot from the first experience. And everybody had forgotten the 1967 one. And I'm afraid so, and that's one of the things where I think we need to be really careful about writing down and keeping and passing on the what were the lessons of these crises, what, what does it mean for our procedures, what should we change, what are the things to look for in the first few hours. It sounds to me as you're in the Mark Twain school, history doesn't repeat itself but sometimes it rhymes. Exactly, and uh, there are things that come along like the financial crisis in 2008, you know, the mem for me, the memories of the uh, Black Wednesday and the exchange rate mechanism and us falling out of that, there were elements of that about it. The, the fact that it moved so quickly, the fact that over a weekend you're faced with a situation where all of the big banks were basically bust and you're thinking about how do we uh, save that situation, obviously Treasury in the lead. But if you've been through something like that before and you realise that financial markets move incredibly quickly, you know then that you can't afford to say, well, let's sit back, let's uh, analyse this to death. And actually, if you do that, the patient is dead before you've prescribed any medicine. A clever young historian might look back and think, every time there's a big crisis, there's Gus in one form or another <laughs> lurking in the inner group. That's unkind. But you have been through a few, haven't you? Uh, yes, I would say, I mean... Coming back to number 10, you can't help but remember when I was downstairs in the, in the cabinet room and the IRA decided to test out their mortar bombs uh, and landed them in the garden, which was quite fortunate because if they'd landed them slightly closer to home, we, you would now be talking to somebody else, Peter. Yeah, yeah. it's bare thinking about it, is it? Did you really want the job in the first place? Because I remember we had a conversation at a British Academy do economic history. It was a special economic history mm -hmm. evening. And I said, uh, you'll take the job if you're offered, won't you? 
And you were not, you, you didn't strike me as the most ambitious man in the world for the job. I've never taken the view that within the civil service is a greasy pole and you're trying to get to the top of it. What I'd always thought about the civil service was it gave you incredibly interesting jobs. You know, I loved the jobs I had. And as an economist, you know, I was um, uh, like a bear in a honey pit, you know, with, with in the treasury, because it was everything I'd ever been taught, you know, and, and things like liquidity traps I've been taught, I thought would never, ever be useful, turned out to be incredibly useful. So I loved the treasury. When uh, Andrew uh, was due to retire, the question was, Andrew, Andrew Turnbull, my, uh, he'd be my predecessor as head of the treasury, question was, did I want to apply for the cabinet secretary job? And to be honest, by then, I was beginning to see uh, the broader uh, situation in terms of the whole breadth of government policy, because in Treasury you're, you're funding the spending of all of it. And I became much more interested in the whole questions of leadership, leading the civil service, so the head of civil service role really appealed to me. And you know, the whole question about modernising public services, which is something that Tony Blair was passionate about, and I felt I could contribute as his cabinet secretary. Who were your models for the job of cabinet secretary and how did you learn from them? Well, you, I remember a discussion because I, I got them all in a room very early on to say, look, you know, can I learn from you? And, and they, the phrase they all used was, you know, you're standing on the shoulders of your predecessors and you're building on what they've established. And when I look back on it, Robert Armstrong's ability to write in such a way that decades later, you feel that you're right in the moment with him mm. was fantastic. Robin had been, I, I'd worked Robin as Butler, Robin yes. Butler, I'd worked as press secretary to John Major when Robin Butler was uh, cabinet secretary. And I'd observed the way Robin handled some incredibly difficult things, uh, Alan Clark diaries, all those sorts of things. So I learned quite a lot from Robin about and also another person with a treasury background about how to kind of broaden out, think about the, the wider breadth of things. And of course, the, the, the issues about uh, the press and getting them in perspective, because obviously my press secretary experience was quite good, but there was more to life than just the next day. You've been John Major's press secretary in the treasury and here in number 10. Exactly, that's right. So I'd, I'd got that experience, but I, but it, to be honest, one of the important things to learn was not to take the press side of things too seriously. It shouldn't dominate. You need to get that longer term vision. And then after Andrew, there was Richard, who'd had a lot of experience in, in some areas that turned out to be very important in my time. Home office, crime issues, you know. Their energy too. Energy, exactly. That was all, all important. And then Andrew, in a sense, Andrew kind of had brought me along, had, had made, you know, been instrumental in me becoming permanent secretary of the treasury and instrumental in making sure that that handover uh, was as smooth as possible and I'm eternally grateful to him for that. So there's a kind of apostolic succession about all this? Well I think the point is there are so few of us as cabinet secretaries uh, the ones that are alive have all got together and have all kind of helped each other you know because there are these big crises. Some of them uh, actually never become public. So there are certain things that you can just talk to a very small number of people about. And it's a classy so, little trade union, really, isn't it? Well, it's, it's a group of mutual learning. And of course, you know, we, we disagree about certain things and, and we uh, place our emphasis in different places. But I think the core of you know, our support for the traditional civil service values of honesty, objectivity, integrity, impartiality. That's there in all of us. The great Northcote Trevelyan principles. Exactly, and getting those uh, put into legislation in 2010, I was extremely lucky that that happened during my watch, but actually, again, it had been prepared, the ground had been prepared by many of my predecessors. I suppose in human terms, because of the sensitivity of some of the material, a lot of the material the Cabinet Secretary sees, there are very few people you can talk to about some of it. That's absolutely right, Peter. And, and at times someone like you would be someone you couldn't talk to about some of those issues and you would I'm find crushed, that quite difficult, but uh, <laughs> absolutely true. How vital was, we mentioned it already, about your earlier experience in Number 10. I mean, Black Wednesday, you were over in Admiralty House. 
and losing a billion quid an hour at the height of all that. I mean, that must have been the most extraordinary episode in September 1992. You carry the scars, didn't you? Uh, let's not exaggerate. It was only a billion dollars an hour. Billion? I'm so sorry. <laughs> but... If only I'd known. <laughs> <laughs> but it was dramatic. I mean, lesson number one, uh, don't go to Admiralty House if number 10 is being redecorated. The you know. Cuban Missile Crisis blew up uh, when Macmillan was over there. Precisely. Now, I see I didn't learn my lesson of history. Uh, actually, then I was press secretary, let's be clear, so I, I, I'll blame the cabinet secretary at the time. <laughs> but it was uh, a massive crisis, uh, one that we weren't really well prepared for, as prepared as we should have been. And we didn't have the information flows in Ambleti House, mm -hmm. and it was a big trauma. We didn't even have a Reuters screen, I think. No, uh, no Reuters screen. The paper had to come in with the exchange rate. Didn't it? There, were, there were people on the phone. Uh, the phone bill was pretty dramatic, but uh, it was, uh, for me, quite traumatic. And it, it put me off fixed exchange rate systems, and it certainly influenced my attitude to whether or not we should join the euro, in, in the sense of I was passionately... You changed that day, did you? Passionately against. You changed that day. Oh, yeah, I, I was never a great fan of fixed exchange rate systems. Uh, big fan of inflation targeting, but not fixed exchange rate systems. History had taught me how they, they can go badly wrong. And it's a kind of an attempt to put politics above economics. And in the end, that can work for a while, but eventually the economics will out. In human terms, it must have been quite extraordinary. I think it was Douglas Hurd or Ken Clark, one of the others, uh, describing how they were brought in, the senior ministers, to dip their hands in the blood <laughs> before we withdrew from the exchange rate mechanism and all that, and, and seeing how people reacted to it. Well, it must have been quite extraordinarily interesting. Yeah, there was what you might call the A team. The, the, the heavyweight senior ministers were all there in Admiralty House, and it was a big moment because this was a change in the government's fundamental economic policy, but also there were implications. You know, did this mean that we were uh, going to change our stance uh, with respect to membership of the European Union. You know? And I think Ken Clark was uh, very uh, keen that it should be clear to everybody that we had left reluctantly, that we hadn't said, oh, thank God, we can get out of this, because I think he felt that we'd missed out on the earlier moves in Europe and we should have been much more in the mainstream much earlier. Yes, yeah. What surprised you about the job of Cabinet Secretary once you started it? Something you hadn't perhaps anticipated? I don't, some of the elders hadn't told you about? I don't think you can ever quite comprehend the sheer breadth of the job because everything uh, matters in one way or another. You know, it, it could be uh, something to do with crime figures one day. It could be some personal scandal of a politician uh, another day. It could be a nuclear issue, which is one of those long running, big philosophical questions about you know, precisely what are we trying to do in terms of nuclear deterrence. So it's that breadth that I think you, you kind of know it's there, but then suddenly something from all of those areas will come up. And one of the things you, you realize, which you hadn't quite got before, was that no easy questions ever come up to the Cabinet Secretary, that someone else has dealt with them all along the way. So the only ones that really come to your desk that you really have to spend your time on are the ones where they're, they're very hard. <laughs> surprise, surprise. You know, and people have very strong and different views. And you're trying to help Prime Minister's Cabinet get to a view when there are great differences amongst them. And when they're all united, it's completely straightforward. Do you think then it's a supreme advantage that we haven't got a politicised senior civil service because you, you giving reality to them, uh, telling them what they need to know rather than what they wish to hear is absolutely crucial, isn't it? And if you were a political appointee, there'd be question marks about that. I think that's absolutely right. I think you find, you know, that this move to give me uh, some policy-based evidence, you know, I, this is what I believe go and find some evidence to back it up, as opposed to the principle, you know, that honesty, objectivity part of, we will go out there and tell you what the evidence uh, tells us about what works and what doesn't work. And we might suggest to you some ways of creating more evidence. And 
give it to people in an unvarnished, independent method, uh, form to say, look, here are the pros and cons of this policy. Uh, in the end, we advise ministers decide. And once they've decided, we do our best to implement it to the best of our knowledge. But it's really important that we do that telling truth under power and give them our independent, objective views. Do you think that's the prime requirement for a cabinet secretary, the indispensable one, whatever the circumstances, whatever the party, whatever the prime minister is, the speaking truth under power? I think that's what prime ministers most want uh, and most need. Uh, you know, it can be uncomfortable at times, but when you look back on it, uh, it would have helped every prime minister when there's something that's gone badly wrong. You know, were they warned about this in advance? If they were warned and they kind of weighed it all up and in the end said, well, I'm still gonna do that, absolutely fine but you know if if you had a system that basically said yes minister yes prime minister all the time and didn't do that challenge and then suddenly oh my god that policy didn't work I, I, what happened what went wrong there uh, and they'd not been warned then I think the civil service would have uh, gone wrong you know it is our job to do that challenge function you were the first Freedom of Information Cabinet Secretary, if I can call it that, because shortly before you came into the job, in January 2005, the Freedom of Information Act went live, mm -hmm. and you had to deal with the consequences of that. Now, uh, I don't think you look back on that aspect of the job with excessive pleasure, do you? Well, there, there are two sides to this. On the one hand, because for me it was quite a paradox, I'm a believer in a lot more openness and transparency. I wanted us to publish a lot more data, to get out there and publish evidence more. And you know that the economist in me wanted all of this, and I could see the, from all the latest ideas in behavioral sciences that actually publishing a lot more, being more transparent, was a really good thing. On the other hand, Freedom of information created a massive uncertainty at the heart of government because all of the policy advice was subject to this, there were exemptions for policy advice, they were subject to this caveat about public interest test. And in reality, nobody knew whether what you were writing down would eventually be deemed uh, publishable, FOIable as we called it. So it created this uncertainty which led to changes in behaviour. So ministers started to say, mm, I'm not sure I want that meeting, thank you very much. And, you know, what are we going to write down about this? And uh, all of these areas where the risk is the records become doctored in advance so that if they're put out there and they're published, they don't create any controversy or whatever. But actually, what you want in cabinet, for example, is those people that disagree with the policy to actually argue their case as openly and as clearly as possible. And as Cabinet Secretary, I always wanted the Cabinet Minutes to reflect that discussion accurately. And they did during my time, which is why I was quite passionate about trying to keep Cabinet Minutes uh, uh, confidential, at least for a period. I should declare an interest, as, because I was the Information Commissioner's witness at the Tribunal on the Iraq cabinet, the Attorney General's yes. opinion. And, um, and you, you won, and I lost. Yes, <laughs> but the Prime Minister of the day overrode, Indeed. as they're allowed to under the Act, yes. That's right. So I should be honest about that, we were on different sides. Do you think, on that instance, because my argument, not that it's relevant to this interview, was that the public interest was so overwhelming in that case, peace and war. Mm. But do you and think I think it was the system working, you know, it was, mm. uh, I was putting the case, I was worried that this would create a precedent which would mean future cabinet minutes on, on, on all sorts of other subjects might have been made public and no one would really know. And if, if cabinet minutes on something very sensitive became public, then why, why wouldn't you publish anything? So, so there were issues both ways and you argued your case and then as the legislation allows, the cabinet decided to veto. To override, yes. So you think FOI has had a chilling effect? I think you've used that phrase. Yes, most certainly FOI has had a, a chilling effect in terms of, uh, I think you see it now that there are probably more conversations on mobile phones. Um, it's been offset somewhat by coalition. Coalition has, has led to a resurgence of cabinet government in many ways. And it cabinet also means they leak like mad, not me, Gov. The coalition, don't they? Uh, I mean, the, the, there was a budget in recent memory where hardly anything hadn't leaked by the week before. You must have been horrified. Uh, I was horrified. Um, but in a sense, that's, that's a... I think we shouldn't... Uh, we need to separate out these two effects. One is having proper 
uh, governance structures. They had proper cabinet committees and, and coalition, obviously, with the requirement of chair from one party, deputy from the other, meant a lot better structure, a lot better argument. These things were thought through more, and you got them, to use the word I kind of coined for this, coalitionized, so that you wouldn't get the coalition falling out about them, which I think is important. On the other hand, of course, yes, if, if they start disagreeing with each other and, and they start doing it publicly, then you get a lot of leaks, which, which damages the whole thing. So, but I think the important thing there is to say, don't leak. You were the sort of leading marriage guidance counsellor for the coalition, weren't you, in your last months? I was, uh, I think that's been exaggerated. Facilitator is all I would say. And I think what I did with, with uh, help from, from you and many others was to actually kind of lay out as far as one could, what were the rules of this kind of procedure? I mean, un, unclear parliaments are quite difficult uh, for us. So with the Hung Parliament, it was, well, how are you going to sort out what happens next? And of course, there, are, there can be a lot of uh, false uh, stories around as to, oh, well, the, the such and such, well, the Prime Minister's got to resign immediately or Prime Minister mustn't resign. And, it was important to, to establish what the conventions were, what the rules were, uh, to ensure that the Queen remained above politics. I think those things were important. And then to let the political parties get on with it. So it wasn't a question of me attempting to bring about any particular result. It was the question of letting the political parties get together in whatever form they wanted and for them to resolve the issue because that's the way it should be in a democracy. Adapting to the working styles and methods of Prime Ministers is obviously crucial to being Cabinet Secretary. And you had three very different Prime Ministers, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown and David Cameron. Um, Robert Armstrong only had one Prime Minister, the primary colours, tremendous figure. Um, but you got through three, and got through quite an unfortunate verb, but you, you were there when we had three very different Prime Ministers. Could you give me a little cameo? It would be very useful for the students in the years to come of the working styles of your three prime ministers. Yes, but just one point, first of all, that it, it is very relevant. For example, when Robin Butler was there and Tony Blair came in as prime minister, what you had was a very, very experienced cabinet secretary and a new prime minister who hadn't ever had even a junior ministerial job. So that's one kind of relationship. When I came in as cabinet secretary for Tony Blair, Tony Blair had been Prime Minister for a number of years, and I was a new Green Cabinet Secretary. Eight years, I think. Eight years, exactly. So, so, you know, he'd kind of established the way he was going to do the job of Prime Minister by then. And so you're, you're working with a working style which he had already established, and which, after eight years, he wasn't going to change fundamentally. So I wasn't able to say, well, Prime Minister, How's about we move to having lots of cabinet committees and... and you didn't uh, try and you, this tell or argue the, the, the today nudge it towards being more collective, did you? Um, I, I think he was beginning to see and it was beginning to emerge that there were disadvantages of that, that some of the issues about some of the most difficult issues, issues he'd had to deal with where I think a more formal process might have helped him. But... He was very much established in a certain style and you tried to accommodate to that style whilst at the, time, at the same time pointing out that there were other ways of doing things. But I think eight years on, he, he wasn't going to fundamentally change the way he worked. And he was also, of course, a very you know, passionate moderniser. And he wanted to move on and he wanted public services to be uh, better and more citizen focused. So you, you needed to find ways of, of working with him. You know, he's very much into uh, stake, um, you know, stock takes to, to determine delivery. You know, were we on track? Have we hit the milestones? All of that. And so he had that style of saying, right, you know, roll up his sleeves, get down. I want to know the street crime numbers for these streets and come back in a week and tell me precisely how many. You know, he got very much into detail and was, I think, somewhat exasperated by the, well, you know, if I don't do it myself, it doesn't happen. Uh, and, you, and you sometimes hear that. So that was his style. Uh, if I think then Gordon Brown, well, Gordon was, was uh, as it were, on day one, wanted to use cabinet more. We had a very, very long cabinet meeting, I think actually in this room, uh, where we discussed 
detailed constitutional issues uh, at great lengths. Why were you in this room? It was first, uh, first cabinet. Um, we wanted to, he wanted to uh, do something slightly different, and so we um, we actually we all sat around in these wonderful sofas. We we no 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 we had. Proper table, proper table, so very formal. brought him up here. How interesting. Um, so it was, and it went on and on, because you had to warn him that the hacks outside might think there was some great crisis. <laughs> well, you passed him a note. We'd, we'd, we'd asked everybody uh, to read this enormous document, which had things like House of Lords reform, had an enormous number of potential constitutional changes. And uh, I think what Gordon Brown wanted to do was signal a more collegiate approach, wanted to listen to everybody's views. So he'd started going around the table and we got to about the third person. And because there were lots of big issues and they needed to state their view on all of them. And he had an enormous cabinet. Well. It was a big cabinet. Yeah. And uh, so I had to pass him a note saying, look, um, at this rate, Prime Minister, we'll be here till midnight. Which he then read out to the attached cabinet, which wasn't quite what I'd intended. But um, anyway, we managed to get through it. So. I think the, the thing for uh, Gordon Brown's time was it, totally dominated by the financial crisis. And actually, if ever there was a man for the moment, you would want a man who'd spent his time being chancellor for all of his cabinet career and then moving into the job when what we really needed was someone that understood uh, the nature of a financial crisis. And he played a leading role in the G20 summit and bringing that together and corralling uh, world leaders in a way that uh, played to his strengths of, you know, really forcefully saying, we really need to do something and we need to do it quickly. That speed that, that you learn in the Treasury because financial markets move like that uh, was really important in those days. So he was very focused and very driven by the, by the economic side. And then when it came to the coalition, David Cameron was someone who you could see uh, was used to managing, you know, managed a very difficult start. You know, he, he didn't get an overall majority and some in his party were thinking, why, why can't we uh, rule on our own? And of course, his cabinet, he had to uh, find room in his cabinet for some, you know, six lib Liberal Democrat ministers. And so disappoint some of the people who'd been with him all the days who thought they would be in cabinet. So it was a very difficult place to start and of course there was no history of coalition so you know the fact that um, he and the deputy prime minister made things work and got on and they weren't the lowest common denominator you know they they actually got together and said right there's a big deficit problem let's have a spending review let's you know embark on some big radical changes in welfare in health in transport in education you know I, I think kind of contradicted what a lot of people thought would be coalition, which would be, oh, it's mushy, they're not going to do very much, you know, they won't be able to do anything. We've seen with this government that uh, you could criticise them for many things, but actually you couldn't criticise them for lack of action. So the follow-up to the, those three Prime Ministers, is there, <clears throat> is there one or two, are there one or two indispensable characteristics that all Prime Ministers have got to have? whatever party, whatever circumstance, however long they waited for the job, however great or little their experience before they come in through that door. Yes, the, w the one thing I'd say, more than any other, which nobody really mentions, is physical fitness. It's a very demanding job. And if you are not physically fit, you will uh, suffer. And fortunately, I had in, in Tony Blair, Gordon Brown and David Cameron, Three people who actually did uh, care a lot about their fitness were, you know, all took uh, exercise and, and realise this was important because you need them to, to function. You know, European councils, they delight in kind of waiting to the last hour and then going on two or three more hours and then trying to get to a, a final deal. And you need a really good negotiator in there who's right on top of the job. And I think British prime ministers excel in that. I saw it all the way through from John Major, who, uh, who really did... Uh, do all of his work on Europe and was better prepared and briefed than, than any of his uh, other EU counterparts. And is there another thing they need? Uh, I'd say um, they need a bit of a thick skin because prime ministers are praised and blamed and they need to, you know, I think it's that, that thing at Wimbledon, you know, you treat both those imposters just the same. Kipling. It was Kipling, they exactly. They all have to know how to kipple. They, they, they yeah. should go to, yeah, 
centre court, see that phrase and, and just say, right, I am not going to let myself get uh, deflected from my course by everyday events, you know. Some of your prime ministers have thicker skins than others. That's always the way. Yeah. But, but the, the key thing is, you know, having that strategic vision, thinking about what's right for the country in the long term and just sticking to your guns on those things. That's what makes a great prime minister. Can I ask you about the organisation of government at the centre? We academics and our students have lived off this great debate about whether the cabinet secretary's job should be talent tied in with the home civil service or not, whether we should have a prime minister's department, all sorts of things. And the organisation of the centre has vexed everybody. And of course it reflects what prime ministers of the day want. Do you think there is a, there is a, a model that works better than the others? Well, I think we need to realise that globalisation has meant that heads of state and government have to do more. Right? There are more uh, issues that are handled at the international level now. You know, take things like climate change, take things like financial regulation and, and dealing with crises. You know, these, these things, they go across borders very quickly uh, and you need international solutions. And our international machinery isn't very good. You know, the international machinery for climate change, I'd say, is, is, is completely broken. Uh, we have some that was left, uh, the Bretton Woods Twins, the IMF and the World Bank, after the Second World War. But again, they don't reflect the economic realities of today. You know, the, the weight uh, that countries like China and Korea have is, is too small. So in the absence of that international organisations working effectively, individual heads of government have to come together and solve those problems. Uh, if you're going to do that, a Prime Minister needs to be able to manage that set of issues. So you do need a, a, a quite a strong centre. And I think we are one of the smallest centres, if even you look, now. even now. Mm -hmm. When you look about the, you know, the size of the Elise, uh, oh, sorry, of the, uh, um, the, in, in the White House, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, we're tiny compared to most others. So I think you do need a strong centre, you need lots of expertise, and you need a mix of political and civil service skills, I would say. Do you think we have a Prime Minister's Department that dare not speak its name, because old traditionalist fuss pots like me and one or two others might, and the certain select committees might get into a bit of a strop about it? I, I, I've never kind of got too uh, excited about that one way or the other. You know, it's the Cabinet Office. Number 10 is part of the Cabinet Office. Uh, the two work together. So they're fused? They're, they're fused, if you like, yeah. So and it is a Prime Minister's Department that they're not speaking it's, it's, it's a Cabinet Office which has within it the Prime Minister's Department and has to manage the Prime Minister and Cabinet. Very tactfully put. Thank you. Going back into the more granular bits of the job of the Cabinet Secretary, do you think it's a good idea for the Cabinet Secretary to be the accounting officer for the single intelligence account, I think it's called these days? In other words, overseeing the budgets of the secret world, because that job has come in and out Indeed. of the Cabinet Secretary's yes. office. And now we have a National Security Advisor. But you, I think you were the last one to have, have it. Have it I, I had it. Uh, it was partly a, a combination of circumstance of whether you, you had an individual at the time who could be the right person for it. Uh, I felt that it was important for the Cabinet Secretary to have an understanding of what was going on in the uh, intelligence world. I think with the post 9-11, terrorism was such a big issue uh, for the UK, post 7-7 for us, of course. Um, and as Cabinet Secretary, you needed to be able to advise Prime Ministers on that set of issues as well. Now, I happen Given my experience now with the National Security Council and having a National Security Advisor, I think that's worked extremely well. And I think I would be of the view that if you've got a really experienced National Security Advisor and they work closely with the Cabinet Secretary, and when, of course, in my, my time I had National Security Advisor living right beside me, that, I think, in Peter Ricketts, that worked incredibly well. It has the whiff of permanence about it, the National Security Council, National Security Advisor organisation, doesn't it? I, I hope so. I, I think it's one of those innovations that's actually uh, worked very well and I hope it will be there across any change of administration. And you were unusual, I think it's only happened once, that when you were Cabinet Secretary, the Prime Minister had his own permanent secretary in Jeremy Haywood, because mm -hmm. normally it's a very senior figure, it's principal private secretary or whatever. Mm -hmm. But having double-headed permanent secretaries was a bit odd, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was slightly odd. I think it was partly the fact that you know, Jeremy had been outside uh, doing some time in the, in the private sector, learning about the private sector. And 
was a very experienced uh, civil servant, uh, very, very good at advising the Prime Minister. And of course, uh, you know, Prime Ministers quite often want someone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you're Cabinet Secretary, actually it's quite important that you don't fall into doing that because actually you need to stand back, look at the bigger picture. There are plenty of things that are really important that Cabinet Secretaries do that don't have anything to do with the Prime Minister, actually. So it's being head of the Home Civil Service. Exactly, case. yeah. Uh, and so there are, there are plenty of things you need to go away and do. So having someone who can be there uh, by the Prime Minister's side, as long as the, the coordination is absolutely, you know, the coordination between someone doing that job and the cabinet secretary is absolutely vital. And of so course, where you've gone on with Jeremy, really, isn't it? Well, the, the kind of untold secret, of course, was that every morning we drove in together and actually <laughs> sorted out. So at that time, fix the country. Jeremy you could, in. well, yeah. he could tell me about you know the issues of the day that were coming out, and I'd say, well, what I'm worried about is you know this, this, and this, kind of somewhat longer term, and we'd make sure that the two fitted together. So, so it, you're trickling in from South London, just fixing the world and the country. We were doing our best, but um, as, as mandarins, you know, trying to ensure, ensure that uh, we had an efficient form of government. Do you think it's a good idea that the headship of the civil service should normally be allied to that of the cabinet secretary post? Well, the, the, we, during the, the post-war period, post-Second World War period, we've had both uh, models, and I think both can work. Uh, I think at the moment when you've got a coalition government and uh, there are lots and lots of changes going on for the civil service, you know, it's a, it's a difficult time for the civil service with the pay restraint, the cuts and all the rest of it. Uh, having the two separated makes a lot of sense and I think, you know, I think they're doing the jobs incredibly well. Uh, is this a model forever? No, I think it's, you know, if, if we got back to a world where we didn't have a uh, coalition and we're, you know, hopefully we're in a world where the deficit is um, more under control, maybe even gone, uh, who knows. Um, then I think you could get to a world where you reunify the jobs. If I was a new prime minister and I said, Gus, here's a blank piece of paper, forget about the past, organise the centre for me, how would you do it? Uh, I have this big behavioural insight team, which, we, which we've already got, but I'd make it much bigger. Um, I'd have a National Security Council. I, I would have the things, actually quite a lot of the efficiency stuff I'd probably put in the Treasury. I think that's the, the right place for, for most of the efficiency and reform world. I'd have Treasury overlooking that. Um, and I would have in uh, number 10 a, a big strategy unit and something to keep an eye on implementation. Mm. Those would be my main so features. This place would be the strategic bit. The Treasury would do all the gritty stuff. Yes. Yeah. And you'd have a cabinet secretary on top of it all. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. You've become an expert in exits and continuity. We've already talked a bit about the Hun Parliament contingency and so on. But um, the emotional geography of all this is fascinating. Mm. When a prime minister leaves mm. and people get all tearful and mm. all the rest of it. And, clap in a new Prime Minister if they've won an election, but not if they haven't, and all this. There's, there's a choreography to these exits and entries, and you've had to do two of them, mm. haven't you? Mm. Um, how, how do you cope with all that? Because people, people are in a high state of emotion, and if it's after a general election, particularly if you've had five days of negotiation, everybody's a bit frazzled, the mm. nerve ends are all raw. Mm. There are two kinds of changes, as you rightly said. I've had uh, two examples of change of Prime Minister within the same party, so not at the time of a general election when John Major took over from Margaret Thatcher and Gordon Brown took over from Tony Blair. And you're right, the thing that people underestimate and usually forget about is the emotional side of this. People have worked very closely for the Prime Minister, the outgoing Prime Minister, and you need to understand that you know, those, those links are, are very strong and that Prime Minister is, is being, if you like, ejected without the kind of the public having had their say in a general election. So it's, it's a difficult period and, and you need to understand and manage people emotionally. And then of course there's the practicalities that a new prime minister wants to make their mark and they are by definition different. And the fact that there's been a change of prime minister means there has been some kind of 
traumatic event of some kind, you know, I think of Margaret Thatcher and everything that was going on there. And so the party have decided that they want to change and you've got to try and manage that process. And all, there will always be the people who think there should never have been a change. So you've got a kind of slightly divided party there that you're trying, as it were, to unite as a government to ensure that they get on effectively and possibly change some of the predecessors' uh, policies. Mm. Which, you you know, also have if, the job of briefing them into the world that is hypersensitive, <clears throat> that you can never really talk about in detail, which is the intelligence side and also the nuclear weapon side, because it all falls to them. And cabinet secretaries have to manage all of that too, don't they? Which is quite tricky, because I've always thought that that's when prime ministers realise they're prime ministers, when you do the old briefing on the nuclear retaliation system. I mean, mercifully, it only falls to prime ministers. Doesn't it? Indeed. And, and it's a, those sorts of issues very early on, you know, some of the things that aren't public, that they haven't known about, and they, you have to tell them, look, there is this, you know, for example, ongoing terrorist plot that we're monitoring and we're worried about. Um, you know, it's a big burden of responsibility, and prime ministers have to make some really important key judgments and you have to help them in that process but in the end they have to make them. The cabinet manual will always be, uh, I think that is a permanent fixture now, the British constitution its moving parts as seen by the executive in the relation to it. It's not a written constitution by any means but it's some, something we've never had before and the, the, you've already talked about the bit that was done first ready for the possibility of a hung parliament which turned out to be Pretty crucial. But it seems to me on that bit of the cabinet manual, the Hun Parliament circumstance, it still all depends on what an old cabinet office hand, Clive Priestley, used to call the good chap theory of government, mm -hmm. whereby good chaps of both sexes, everybody involved, has to know not to push it too far, where the un unwritten rules are and where the, guy, where the lines in the sand aren't even visible. And if in the fraught circumstances of a hung parliament, when somebody's might going to lose power or not get it, perhaps never, uh, all sorts of strange things can be uh, claimed. And without that bit of paper last time round in the television studios, those of us who had to impersonate the Constitution, we'd have been in real trouble, as indeed you would have been as well. But it does depend on them actually not pushing it too far. It would only take one of them to behave like a cad, to use an old-fashioned word, and break the good chap theory, and you'd be stuffed, wouldn't you, Gus? Despite well, having the cabinet manual I think about how to behave. All you can do is, is, is prepare. And I think this is one of those classic things where preparations in peacetime, as it were, help you out uh, during the war. In that you, you, know, you, you get everybody quietly around a table when this is just a theoretical possibility and say, well, you know, in the event this were to happen, how should we all behave? What should we do? Uh, and let's try and lay down some conventions, some guidelines, all those sorts of which things. Which we did in 90 minutes in your office, which, roughly. Which we, you know, there was a lot of work behind the no, scenes, I can safely right. say, you know, and Gordon Brown had started the whole process off. So uh, we, we got through that and I think that was very useful. Uh, but, it's, but it's not an answer to all possible questions. As you rightly say, you know, if, if I imagine if you're sitting down in Italy now, uh, even if you had a cabinet manual, it's going to be pretty tough for them to... Uh, I should say, we're talking just as the Grillinis, I think we've got to call them. These other strange people have acquired a large number of seats in the Senate and the Assembly in Rome. I think it's fair to say it makes the situation we had after our election look pretty straightforward. <laughs> the National Security Council we've talked about, uh, it was a considerable innovation. For historians, it's the old committee of imperial defence by another name, but even so, it's very important. Do you think that could be a model for other aspects of uh, cabinet government? Because it's got its own rhythm of papers, agendas and minutes in the classic way, and it's changed the intelligence feed. It's much the tasking body now of intelligence. And Michael Heseltine is very keen on a national growth council mm. with the prime minister mm. chairing. So do you think this is a, a model that could be used more across the cabinet system? I do, and, and the reason... I think the innovation that's in it is the fact that round that table you've got the senior ministers but you've also got the, the so-called experts. So you've got the heads of the agencies, uh, the heads of the armed agencies, forces, the exactly. Mm -hmm. So you've got a mixture of officials and ministers, pol politics and civil servants, all working together to try and solve problems. And I think, you know, we've developed a system which has lots of meetings of civil servants and then 
papers prepared that go to a meeting just of politicians. Uh, and there's obviously a case for you know, so, something like cabinet clearly being about the you know, ultimate body for politicians. But I think along the way we could f uh, get a lot more done, uh, and it was certainly done during the National Economic Council uh, when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister, of having uh, officials, ministers round the table grappling with an immediate problem, you know, the, the, the recession. And also in that we bring in outsiders, outside experts who would say, you know, uh, what's going on out in the world, who would give you a specifics about what the problem was about banks and lending to small businesses or what the specific problems individuals were facing in terms of uh, Poverty, uh, you know, the Citizens Advice Bureau, head of that, would come in. And, and, and so you get external experts as well. So you get all the expertise around a table. And I think uh, David Cameron, as Prime Minister, used to say what he really liked was having the, all the experts, you know, lay out what they knew, the evidence and, and discussion, and be cross-questioned. And then the politicians have the discussion about, OK, in the light of all of that, you know, we've, we've heard all this advice, what are we going to decide? And, and then as well, thinking about, okay, once we've decided something, how do we present it? What are the issues? So, uh, and, and where do we go next? And what are the things we want these officials to go off and find out more about, give us more evidence, you know? So I, I think that system works well mm. and could be used much more widely. Mm. Did you ever think of resigning? No. I'm, I'm pleased to say I never got put in a situation where I thought this is a resigning matter. What would be a resigning matter for you? It won't arise now. You're safe, you can tell me. Uh, yeah, it's not going to happen. I, I think if, uh, if there had been something which tried to... Uh, an issue which involved me breaking the civil service values, the honesty, objectivity, integrity, impartiality. If, if somebody they tried had, to politicise you? Maybe. Yes, exactly. I, you know, and said, look, we, we want you to uh, manage this process because it's going to help party A beat party B. Um, but that's never, I stress, no Prime Minister, no Minister has ever uh, got even close to asking me to do anything like that. What will be the last thing about the job of being Cabinet Secretary that will cling to the Velcro of your memory when you're in your last years, thinking back? I think that the point you said about the, the emotion of the clapping in and clapping out and, and seeing... The, the Downing Street staff come together and clap people in. And it might be clapping in a new prime minister or clapping out an old one, or it might be, I remember vividly, clapping in uh, Michelle and Barack Obama when they uh, become president and come over. Uh, those moments of theatre, I remember David Cameron coming in and, and you know, I've got a photo of him going, oh, what have I let myself in for? You know, and just... Uh, those, those are fantastic moments. And, and the other, I, I suppose my biggest visual memory is standing, actually it's when I was press secretary to John Major, standing on the steps of Downing Street with the Christmas tree there, the first announcement of the first ceasefire in Northern Ireland. That to me was just something amazing. And all the politicians involved in that deserve enormous credit because it was the start of bringing peace to the United Kingdom. Gus, thank you very much. You're welcome.